If I told you there are some cats in my neighborhood, the way to prove that is quite simple. All I gotta do is just show you a photo. But if I say no cat exists within one kilometer of my residence, I'm pretty sure most of you wouldn't believe me. How would I prove that anyway? It's not that showing you a photograph of nothing can prove my claim. They could just be hiding somewhere, you know? So, what about extinction? How could someone declare a species is extinct without even looking in every nook and cranny? So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is extinction? If we're simply talking about concept and definition, extinction is straightforward. If a taxon doesn't exist anymore in this world, no individual of that taxon currently lives in this world, then that taxon is extinct. Pretty sure most people know that. But, the problem is declaring extinction itself. It might sound outrageous, but just like what I brought up earlier, proving the existence of a species is actually easier than proving a species is extinct. Because to prove a species is extinct, all you need is a single observation. While to prove a species is extinct, technically, you have to look at literally every single place at the same time to know for sure that said species is not present. And, let's be real, that is practically impossible. But now, the question is, how do scientists declare a species is extinct then? What is the basis of such claim? Well, let's look at IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, which is THE Global Conservation Organization. Their conservation status is the one being used by most zoologists after all. Well. The criteria for the extinct category in IUCN Red List, as it is written, a taxon is extinct when there is no reasonable doubt that the last individual has died. A taxon is presumed extinct when exhaustive surface in known and or expected habitat at appropriate times, diurnal, seasonal, annual, throughout its historic range, have failed to record an individual. Surveys should be over a time frame appropriate to the taxon's life cycle and life form. Well, it says a lot of things while not exactly specifying anything. I mean, what kind of exhaustive survey and how large of a time frame? That's still too vague. Also, IUCN Red List assessment relies on surveys from researchers and volunteers, which are not exactly strictly dedicated to doing those surveys. You know, they also have other things to do, maybe other research, other projects, or simply not enough resources to do so consistently. The other problem is, survey is very skill-based. It greatly depends on how familiar the surveyor is. Well, to be fair, it also greatly depends on the assessor. After all, data is just data. Conservation statuses are determined by assessor. Well, they do use specific analysis, but that analysis was designed and modeled using a specific species as a model. Which, if you are familiar with ecological analysis, you would know that this will not be applicable to every niche, let alone across different taxa. There are several publications criticizing IUCN's assessment. If you want to know the more technical stuff, you can read this article right here. What I'm trying to say is, the criteria that we currently use to assess extinction is definitely not perfect. And, to be fair, it's never gonna be perfect. It's gonna be improved over time, well, at least I hope so. But still, we're never gonna truly know whether a species is truly extinct or not. The only way we could confirm that is by observing every single place at a single time, which is, like I said, practically impossible. Oh, by the way, there's also another category called extinct in the wild, so let's talk about that. But before that, Extinct in the wild literally means what it says. If we are looking at a natural, wild population, they are extinct. But, they still exist in captivity. There are currently 35 animals that are categorized as extinct in the wild. Which, of course, you can just look at the IUCN website if you are curious. Most, if not all of these, have been in captivity for years. Some even for several decades. Not only are researchers trying to preserve their existence, they are also trying to reintroduce these animals to the wild. Will it ever be successful? Well, we don't know, 
hopefully it will. Still, there are some successful reintroduction cases which elevates the species category from extinct in the wild. The somewhat famous example is the Purtiwalski's horse. Purtiwalski's horse had been categorized as extinct in the wild since 1969. There were only 12 captive Purtiwalski's horse back then. However, in 2014, almost 2,000 individuals exist in the wild. That is quite the achievement. Purtiwalski's horse is currently categorized as endangered. Another relatively famous example, but an ambiguous one, is the case of Northern White Rhino. The last wild Northern White Rhino sighting was in 2007. In 2008, it was considered extinct in the wild by several researchers, but it's still considered critically endangered in the IUCN Red List. If you check IUCN Red List right now, Northern White Rhino is still considered critically endangered. However, if you check the assessment, it is noted that it's possibly extinct in the wild. There are reports of small population in South Sudan, but that is not confirmed. I personally think it's too vague, but it is what it is. Let's just hope it's true. Alright, there is also another famous case of extinct in the wild animal, which is probably the most famous one if I think about it. That is, the Pinta Island tortoise, a subspecies of Galapagos tortoise. Most of you have probably heard of the Lonesome George. If you haven't, then let me tell you a little about it. Lonesome George was first found in Island of Pinta in 1971. That was the only Pinta Island tortoise found. He was then relocated to the Charles Darwin Research Station on Santa Cruz Island. That means it was extinct in the wild because the only individual is in captivity. Well, at least the one that we are aware of. Efforts to mate him with females of another subspecies had been unsuccessful. On June 2012, Lonesome George died, and that's the end of the Pinta Island tortoise. It was declared extinct. Even before he died, Pinta Island tortoise was considered functionally extinct by some researchers. Now that's another concept, so let's talk about it. Functionally extinct animals are animals that are not necessarily gone from the world, but there is no chance for the taxon survival. In the case of Lonesome George, it is the only individual of its subspecies, and all efforts to mate him with females of another subspecies weren't successful. There is no way to make offsprings, which means he will be the last individual of its taxon. And so, the taxon is functionally extinct. Another case is where its niche is completely gone. Let's say, for example, if a creature is dependent on another creature for its survival, and the other creature went extinct, this dependent creature lost its niche and will most likely perish soon enough. There are cases where taxa are considered functionally extinct because their population had been decreasing rapidly with no foreseeable salvation but are actually not functionally extinct. Well, not yet at least. So again, functional extinction assessment can be debatable. I would argue this one is even more debatable than extinction assessment. Sometimes, taxa are presumed to be extinct, but it's actually not extinct. Actually, there are several animals that are presumed to be extinct, but some individuals were then rediscovered years later. I'm sure you've heard of such case before. That is the definite proof that our assessment of extinction is not perfect. They still exist somewhere, we just didn't see it. Oh, by the way, these are sometimes also called Lazarus taxon, which is a term you might have heard before. Traditionally, Lazarus taxon is used for taxa that disappeared from fossil records for periods of time, but then discovered later on, even in this day. The usual example is the coelacanth. Keep in mind that, in this case, the exact species is not the Lazarus taxon. The Lazarus taxon is the order, Silicantiformes, or perhaps even the family, because Latimeria, the genus of the currently extant silicanth itself, is just the two reason silicanth that we can find nowadays. It's not the same genus as the silicanth in the fossil records. Anyway, I did say traditionally, right? Lacasse said, the case where animals that are presumed extinct decades or centuries ago, but are then rediscovered later, are sometimes also called Lazarus taxon by some people. I personally wouldn't use that term, because it will make the term even more ambiguous. But I'm just telling you this so you are at least aware of it. So yeah, knowing for a fact that a species is truly extinct is practically impossible. 
We also need a lot of data from various surfaces over a constant period of time, which is why I always appreciate researchers that are so dedicated to a specific taxon, because those are the constant source of data that is needed for various assessment. Still, of course there are still a lot of taxa that barely receive attention. I hope more people are interested in those taxa. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, in case you are wondering, I will not make a video on the de-extinction claim of direwolves. I did tell my opinion on it in the Discord channel though, and of course you are free to discuss about it here if you want to. Anyway, enjoy your day.